turn to Romans chapter 1. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. I've, I'm going to start a sermon series today that I've been looking forward to preaching for probably the past, I don't know, anywhere between 10 to 20 years. Um, we're going to talk about something today, though, that I'm just going to admit at the beginning. I'm a little bit nervous about the topic um, because, first of all, there's some history that I've got to lay out so that you understand the series and how many of you in history class got bored? Just raise your hand. Be honest about it. All right. So I'm just going to tell you about the first 10 minutes. You might want to just nap a little bit and then we'll wake you up when we get into the, into the good stuff. Okay. So I'm a little nervous about that because we're going to try to lay out basically 1500 years of history and I'm going to try to do it in about three minutes. So good luck with that. Um, but the second thing is, as I share the history behind what I want to talk to you about, I, I'm very mindful of everyone in here and some of you with certain religious backgrounds. And so I want to be very careful with how I say things because I do not want this to be received in any way as bashing a certain denomination, bashing a certain way of thinking. But it's important to understand a, a significant historical event. And that significant event uh, really started a movement that I promise you every person sitting in this room today is affected by this event. So to, to start things off, I was walking through Walmart recently. Don't judge me for that if you're a Target person. I get it, all right? But walking through Walmart, and they already had the Halloween display out with all the costumes there, and a lot of money in those Halloween costumes. I feel like I got in the long, wrong line of work for that, but um, this is not going to be a debate about whether you should or should not uh, let your kids dress up for Halloween, just simply stating that as I was walking through there, I noticed all of these, you know, costumes, and some of them are expensive, like crazy, ridiculous expensive. Now, my parents did allow us to go trick-or-treating when we were kids, and so we had to dress up only as fun characters, whatever. Um, and I was thinking back as I was looking at those costumes, in my childhood, I can only remember one costume that I had, and that was when I dressed up in second grade as Super Grover from Sesame Street. <laughs> That's probably exactly what you thought. I bet Robbie would be a great Super Grover, and I was. And the reason for that was we didn't have a lot of money growing up, and so my costume was whatever you could find. My, my mom and dad were not going to go to Walmart and shop. They were certainly not going to spend any money. One year, uh, the only other one, sorry, that I remember, but I was a little bit older in life, I dressed up as Crest Toothpaste. I just wore white shorts and a white shirt, wrote crest on it, and put a bucket on my head for the lid. That true story. But my second grade year, dressed up as Super Grover, I put a red blanket around my back as the cape and then made a red nose out of a styrofoam ball that I found, painted it red, and put it on my nose. And then I got to class, and the kids are like, what are you? And I'm like, I'm Trooper Grover, or whatever his voice was. And they were looking at me like, that's, that's terrible. That's the worst Super Grover. I wasn't blue. I mean, it was all those things. So... But I remember as a kid, like, you, you're, you're trying to figure out what you want to be, and then Halloween comes, and the next day the outfit's in the trash. I mean, that, that day and that moment is there, and then it's gone. I share that because on October 31st of 1517, there was a moment that a man had been thinking about for, for quite some time, and he did something that was so extraordinary that it shaped human history and has shaped history in the church and the world. And it, it's affecting all of us today. The man's name was Martin Luther. He was a priest. And a, a priest in the Catholic Church. I want to give you a little bit of history that kind of led to this moment. Because I think this is important. And so this is where I told, said earlier that I want to be sensitive with, with what I'm sharing. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus empowered his church in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, you'll receive the power of the Holy Spirit, which happened in Acts chapter 2. And we're talking just a few weeks after the death of Christ. And he said, and when you're empowered by the Spirit, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part or to the ends of the earth. In other words, the gospel of Jesus was going to go forth and God was going to use his church to do that. And that's in fact what happened. The book of Acts is kind of the history of that, uh, of the early growth of the gospel and the propagation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. And sometimes God used persecution to take the gospel, but they were fulfilling that commission. Well, there's another significant event that happened in uh, AD 312, and there was a Roman emperor named Constantine. 
Now, at that time, Christianity had grown throughout the Roman Empire, but Constantine was not a Christian until he had a, um, a vision. And this picture here is actually kind of captures artistically what that vision was. They were fighting at, at it's called the Battle of the uh, Milvian Bridge, and Constantine had a vision of a cross in the sky, and there were some words written in Latin, and the words were, by this conquer. And he felt like that was a sign from God that Christianity was to be embraced by him, and that's what is called the conversion of Constantine, and he became a Christian at that time, or at least affirmed that he was a believer in the cross because of this vision. And when that happened, the Roman Empire went from really being very um, against Christians to being open, at least, to Christianity because of his conversion. From that time in 300 to about the 13th century, the Catholic Church grew in power and in influence. In fact, when you look historically, that denomination, that church had grown to the point that it was even more powerful than many emperors. And they had great political, they had great military and societal influence. In fact, they controlled, it seemed, the Roman Empire. But within the church, there were priests and leaders who were very concerned with what they saw happening. There was corruption in the church. And yes, some of it was moral corruption that would happen with priests uh, stealing money, priests doing things that they shouldn't be doing. But what really bothered them ultimately was the doctrinal uh, truths that were being taught by the church that these priests saw as contrary to what they saw when they read the Bible. And so through the years, there were these people within the church, they're called reformers, who were not trying to break away from the church. They simply said the church has become something that it's not, or it's not the church that Jesus started when we look into the scripture because they're teaching something that's contrary to the word of God. So you had guys like Wycliffe and John Huss, and I'm going to share uh, Huss's story in just a minute or later in the message. But then there came a man named Martin Luther that you saw the picture of earlier. As Luther studied the scripture, he saw some things that were particularly troubling to him. I want to share a couple of them with you. One was the Pope's authority, papal authority. In the Catholic Church, it had grown to this point where the Pope was the voice of God. He was the holy vicar. He was the mouthpiece of God. And in fact, when you read historically, when the Pope would make some kind of edict or some kind of decree, some dogma would be accepted based on his teaching, if what he said contradicted Scripture, then the word of the Pope actually transcended or superseded the Scripture. And guys like Luther and some of the other reformers saw this and said, hang on a second, the, just because a man says it doesn't mean it's necessarily right. Because the, tr the, the teaching of the church was that the scripture is infallible, but what happened was papal authority got it to the point where the pope was seen as infallible. In other words, whatever the pope said was true, he could not err. And guys like Luther read that and saw that being practiced, and they said, hang on a second, the pope is not infallible because he's a human just like me. And I don't know if they would say like he put his pants on one leg at a time, it's probably like he put his robe on one sleeve at a time, whatever you'd say. But they were simply saying, he's not infallible in the same way that we hold to the scripture. And so there was this, this tension that was being felt within the church. And it really bothered Martin Luther and the other reformers because they saw that there was something else happening in the church. And what really bothered them ultimately that kind of led Martin Luther to that moment on All Hallows' Eve in 1517 was what was called the selling of indulgences. Indulgences were forgiveness. And basically, this is going to be a very quick summary of what that was. You would commit an offense, and if you would go to confession uh, to the priest, the priest would tell you to give a certain amount of money, and those sins would be forgiven. Another way that it was being done is you committed some kind of sin, and then you passed away, and someone came and talked to the priest about that. The priest would tell you that if you put enough money in the offering plate, then your sins could be forgiven, and that soul would be released from what's called purgatory in, the, in, that, in that dogma. In fact, one of the reformers, Johann Tetzel, wrote this, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. And he captured what was very egregious to the hearts of these priests because what the church was doing was telling people that in order to be forgiven by God of your sins, you could give an offering. You could simply give money to the church, and in doing that, that would pardon your sin. 
And when Martin Luther was, was reading the scripture, he became convicted that what was being taught in the Catholic Church was not true to scripture. And so on October 31st of 1517, he walked up the steps to the Castle Church in Wittenberg with his 95 Thesis. And he nailed the thesis to the church door at the, at the, the castle church. And what he really hoped would happen was that they would have a debate about it, that they could open up a dialogue to talk about some of the things that he was bothered about in the Catholic church. And this day is seen as the beginning of what's called the Protestant Reformation. Now, we call it the Protestant Reformation, the, those two words, because they were simply protesting, they were Protestants, they were protesting what was happening in the church. And it's Reformation because they wanted it to be reformed. They were saying, what I see there is not right and we need to change it. We need to reform the church. What he hoped to be um, a debate ended up getting him excommunicated from the church as a heretic. And what he and the other reformers taught has kind of been summarized through history in what's called the five solas of the Reformation. And that's what I'm going to preach about for the next month starting today. And I, they'll be on the screen here, but there's five of them. These are Latin phrases. Sola gratia, which means grace alone. Solus Christus, which is Christ alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Soli Deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. And then sola scriptura, which is scripture alone. And we're going to teach these over the next few weeks to understand the biblical basis for what each of these solas really means. And I've written these two sentences just as kind of a summary of the Protestant doctrine. If you'd like to maybe take a picture of this or it's in the notes on the, on the Church Center app. The first one is this. Scripture alone is the final authority. That is the truth. That God's word alone is the final authority in our lives. You may have heard people say, you plus God is a majority. They're wrong. God is a majority with or without you. God doesn't need you. He doesn't need your opinion. I heard a preacher this week, and I heard a clip of a preacher saying that God came to him to ask him his opinion. No, he didn't. <laughs> Scripture alone is your authority. The second one is this. Salvation is granted by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. That's a summary of the Protestant Reformation and the solas of the Reformation. And for Luther, there were some passages. We're going to study one of them in Romans 1 in just a moment. There were some passages that were of particular import to him as he was reading them. And one of them is found in the book of the Bible that if you've been around church, I promise you, you maybe have heard one sermon out of this book. It's the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. It'll be on the screen. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. If you read old school King James, if you're raised that way as I was, the just shall live by faith. And for Luther, that statement was so compelling, not only there in Habakkuk, but because it's, it's repeated throughout other passages. For example, Paul writing to the Galatians in Galatians 3 and verse 11 now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. I want you to hear what that verse is saying. We'll leave it. No person is made right with God or declared just before God by the law. In other words, you're not going to be made right with God by living in obedience to the word of God and being a good enough person to get there. We are justified or made right with God we are made alive, the just shall live by what? Faith. So Luther is reading those passages and others, but one particular book was very formative for him in some of his writings, he shared it. It's Romans chapter 1. I want us to begin in Romans 1 and verse 16, a fairly familiar passage for, for many, but I think there's some really good truth here that I want to mine for just a few moments. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul there in that verse refers back to the Old Testament scriptures that said, shared that truth, Habakkuk and elsewhere, that the just or the righteous shall live by faith. I want us to look at those verses just for a moment. 
And he begins in that verse, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That word gospel, it means good news. Now we're going to leave Romans 1 for just a moment, go one book to the right to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And in this passage, if you want to know what the gospel is, here it is. In fact, I want you to think about that for just a moment. Because what I find alarming when you talk to people, even if they've been in church for a long time, you hear the word gospel said over and over and over again. If I were to bring you up on the stage today and ask you in front of all these people to say, I want you to share with everyone what the gospel is. What I have found is that many Christians who have been to church for a long time struggle with defining what the gospel is. But the gospel, Romans 1.16 said, that gospel is the power of God that saves people. And in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want it to be defined very easily for you or very, uh, very uh, um, clearly, read these verses. Verse 1, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. So this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he says, this is the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being what? Saved. Underline that word. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe, there's faith alone, believed in vain. Here's the gospel, verse 3. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received. Now, before I share this with you, I want you to think back to how Paul received the gospel. He was walking on the road to Damascus as a skeptic of Jesus, didn't believe the story of the resurrection that the early church was preaching. He was going to Damascus to arrest Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem and put them to death, or at least put them in prison. And he's going to Damascus. He meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. He becomes a believer. That's his conversion. That's his Constantine moment. He places his faith in the, in the risen Christ. He goes into Damascus. He stays there. He's discipled for a while. And he tells these Corinthians, this is the gospel that I received. Who did he receive it from? He received it first from Jesus, and then he received it in that discipleship. So he said, the early Christians, the very first believers, taught me this gospel, but Jesus himself did. So he says in verse 3, I'm delivering to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That's one. And that he was buried. That's two. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And then in verse 5, he says that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to Cephas and to other apostles as well. So that's the gospel. I want you to hear it very clearly. The good news that saves people is that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again for our sins. That is the gospel. Now in 1 Corinthians 15 that we just read, in Romans chapter 1, the passage we're going back to, how many times did you hear the word church? Zero. Because the church does not save you. The gospel saves you. The gospel is what you must believe in order to be saved. So back in Romans 1, look at those verses again. I, I'm not ashamed of the good news, the gospel, but then notice the next phrase for it. What is the it there in verse 16? The it is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation. So what saves us? The gospel. And what is the gospel? Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for our sins. That is the pure gospel. And then he says this, that it, is, it has the power of God to save everyone. The good news of the cross is for every person in this room today. The good news of the gospel is for every person that's tuned in online. The good news is for every person you work with, every person you go to school with, every person you have coffee with and lunch with. It's for every person that you're going to see at Thanksgiving dinner, even the ones you don't like. The gospel is for everyone, and it is the power of God to save everyone. But notice who believes. Faith alone. Salvation comes by faith alone. And then he says in verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. We're going to see this in a moment in Ephesians chapter 2. But the Bible is crystal clear that we are not all the children of God. In fact, we are by nature the children of wrath, and we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. And we have been made alive by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The righteous shall be made alive or shall live by faith. Faith in what? 
the gospel that is the power of God to save everyone who believes. So in those early centuries, the teaching of the church changed from first century gospel teaching to this. Salvation is through the church. That was the teaching of the church in those formative years, that salvation came through the church. Whatever the Pope says, that's gospel. Even if it contradicts scripture, the Holy Vicar has spoken, and that means that his word supersedes it. The church practiced indulgences, give an offering, and your sins can be forgiven. And if you're not quite good enough in your life to outweigh the bad that you've done, then your soul will enter a place that's called purgatory. It's taught in the book of Maccabees. And in purgatory, you have family, maybe priests, maybe others who would intercede and pray enough or perhaps give an offering to the church, and then that soul could be released from purgatory. You remember the quote that I had earlier. And also a teaching of the church was this, that in order to be right with God, you had to have the sacraments. You had to receive the sacraments of the church. And those sacraments are baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, or communion. Uh, you would also have to penance or anointing of the sick, holy orders, and then matrimony. In fact, the catechism teaches this. This is a quote. Through the church's sacraments, Christ communicates his holy and sanctifying spirit to the members of his body. I want you to hear well what that says. The church is teaching people that in order to receive the Holy Spirit, you have to be a member of that church, and the way the Holy Spirit enters you is when you receive the sacraments. So when you go, when you're baptized, that's, a, that's covering your original sin. Then when you're confirmed in the church and you make that decision, that's receiving more of the grace of God and the Holy Spirit comes in you. But what does the Bible teach? The Bible teaches that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit enters you immediately at that moment of faith, seals your heart for the day of redemption. It cannot be broken. It cannot be lost. Even if you turn away from God, he does not turn away from his work in you. The Holy Spirit comes inside of you in that moment of faith. But what the church was teaching was that the Holy Spirit came to them as people received the sacraments. So I'm going to illustrate it for you because I think this might help. The Catholic Church in that time was teaching that everyone, the just, shall live by faith. That the gospel and the grace of God is ultimately what saves. So if this represents the grace of Jesus Christ, the grace of God in Jesus, and this represents your life, then all of us acknowledge that we are sinners, that we need a Savior, and that Jesus, and we need God's grace to save us or to fill us. But what the Catholic Church was teaching was between you and Jesus was the church. And that God poured his grace in the church, or uh, into the church, excuse me, and through the Holy Church, you then receive the grace of God that's inside the church through the sacraments. So I'm going to use this high-tech broken fork piece to show you. When you receive the sacraments, when you participate in them, you start with baptism. And at the moment you're baptized as an infant, you begin to receive some of the grace of Jesus. Then you get to a point of confirmation, and when you confirm your faith in the church and you walk through that, then you receive more grace in the church, right? And then you get to the point where you take communion, and through communion, you receive more grace. And so the teaching was, yes, you're receiving the grace of God into your life, but you receive the grace of God in and through what? The church. So the church is ultimately kind of the gatekeeper of the grace of God. And in order for you to receive it, you have to receive it in and through the sacraments of the church. And that's what the church was teaching, that salvation is through the church. But what the scriptures teach is this, salvation is through Christ. Salvation is not in the church. The Brook Church cannot save you. Why? Because the Brook Church is made up of sinners. It's made up of fallible people. In fact, no church, regardless of the denomination, regardless of the pastor or the highest leader in that church, no church can save you because the church is made up of sinful, broken people. The church is the people. It's not an institution. It's not a religion. The church is the people. You are the body of Christ. You are the church. And so no church can save you. Only Christ can save you. In 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 1, and elsewhere in Scripture, you don't ever see the teaching in Scripture that in order to receive salvation, you have to receive the grace of God through the church. 
You don't pray for salvation. The prayer doesn't save you. You don't get baptized for salvation. That baptism doesn't save you. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's believing the gospel that ultimately saves us. So when Martin Luther, as he was receiving these truths in his heart from the scripture, he wrote them down in 95 Theses, and he nailed them to the door of the Castle Church at Wittenberg. And these were the core doctrines of the Christian faith. They became some of the core doctrines that grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone, to the glory of God alone, and by scripture alone, all the solas of the Reformation. And there's something interesting historically when Martin Luther did that, he wasn't necessarily saying that he wanted to change churches. He wasn't putting on the door of the church and the first thesis was, I don't like the music here. His second thesis was not, you know what? The pastor doesn't wear a suit. I'm not going to be a part of this church anymore. The next one was not, I don't like the volume of the music in the church, by the way, since I'm on it. And then number three, I don't like the way the pastor looked at me in the lobby. <laughs> right? Or I didn't like the kids' ministry. I didn't like this. All the things that have become the mantra of the Christian church today. A consumer-driven mentality. Like, it's, let's get as many people in the seats as we can by whatever means possible, and we'll sacrifice whatever we have to sacrifice, and that includes, too often, doctrine, truth from the Word of God. And so when he, when he nailed that thesis to the church, he did that knowing what that could mean. Because one of the reformers that really influenced his life was a man named Jean Hus. He was in the Czech Republic. In fact, on July 6th every year, there's a holiday in that, in that country, and they commemorate this moment where on July 6th of 1415, he was burned at the stake because he was declared a heretic by the Catholic Church, which led to his execution. And do you know what his main central issues were? The same ones that Martin Luther wrote on the 95 Thesis and nailed to that church door. And Martin Luther and John Huss and Wycliffe and the other reformers who ended up giving their lives because of their disagreement with the church we're simply saying this, and I want you to hear it well. There are not a lot of hills that are worth dying on, but the gospel is one of them. There are a lot of things about the church that you shouldn't die on that hill. But the gospel, that's one, that's willing for, that, that's one that you should be willing to give your life for. In Romans chapter 3, I want you to turn there. We're going to study just a, another couple passages. Don't worry. I know you're freaked out about the time. That's all the introduction, and that's shorter than the sermon. So we should be good, all right? <laughs> Two passages here, verse 21 of Romans 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So we find there Christ alone and we find faith alone. Now I want you to hear well what he's saying there in verse 21 and verse 22. That is that the righteousness of God is available to every person. In other words, God's perfection, God's holiness, God's purity is available to every person. In other words, your sins can be covered and completely replaced by the righteousness of God, but it's in Christ alone, by faith alone. But notice at the end of verse 22, with the word for, and then going all the way to the middle of verse 25, you'll find the period for that sentence. So end of 22, 23, 24, and the first part of 25 are all one sentence. And I want us to study that sentence just for a moment. He writes, for there is no distinction. In other words, this is true of everybody. There is, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Three tenets of the solas of the Reformation there. Sola gratia, grace. Solas Christus, Christ alone. Sola fide, faith alone. Did you hear it? They're all in there. Now let's talk about that verse for just a moment because the gospel is the good news, but verse 23 tells us the bad news. There's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone in this room today is a sinner that's in need of a Savior. You don't have to convince me I'm a sinner. I know that I'm a sinner. And I likely don't have to convince you of the same, that you're a sinner. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But when you talk to people about faith in Christ, when you talk to them about, hey, are you a Christian? 
How do you know you're going to heaven? Do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Oftentimes you'll hear this answer. I think so because I'm a pretty good person. And looking around this room, I agree with that. I think you're pretty good people. Some of you, we've got questions about. No, just kidding. You're good people. It's not like you're out here just breaking the law. Go, I hope you're not. You're breaking the law, doing things you shouldn't be doing. Most of you are good people. But here's the problem. The standard is not how good you are. The standard is perfection. The standard is, in verse 23, it's the glory of God for all have sinned and fall short of that standard of perfection. So you're not going to be able to stand before God one day and God let you into heaven because you're a good person. Because the Bible declares earlier in Romans chapter 3, there is no one righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what that means is this, that if the only sin you ever committed in your life was one lie... You're a really good person, but you still fall short of the glory of God. The standard is God's perfection and his holiness. But remember what he had just said in verse 21? That standard, that righteousness is available to you through Christ by God's grace when you place your faith in Jesus. Now notice also in that verse, in verse 23... For there is no distinction, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift. That word justified is a legal term. It's a legal declaration that you have been made right with the lawgiver. Verse 23 is clear that we're, we've all broken the law. We've all gone, gone against God. But God will declare us right with him when we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, going to heaven is not a matter of guilt or innocence. We're all guilty. The difference between going to heaven and not is whether you have been justified by God's grace through faith in Christ and Christ alone. That's the difference. So he says in verse 24 that we are redeemed or justified, excuse me, by his grace as a gift. That phrase there for a moment is so profound. By his grace as a gift. They actually kind of clarify each other. They modify one another. That we are justified by God's grace as a gift. And here's what I want you to see. If it's a gift, it's not earned. If it's a gift, it's not merited. If it's a gift, it's not something that you deserve. In fact, you do not make one contribution to your salvation. Not one. It is Christ and Christ alone. You're simply giving up on anything other than Christ and saying, if I'm going to have a right relationship with God, if I'm going to be justified, it is Christ and his righteousness, his death, his burial, his resurrection for my sins, and that's it. There's no plus, there's no and, there's no but. It's Christ and Christ alone. In fact, Paul wrote this in Ephesians 4. It'll be on the screen. I want to kind of walk through it together. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love wherewith with which he loved us, listen to this, even when we were dead in our trespasses, dead is dead. You are dead in your sins, dead in your trespasses. Notice this phrase, made us alive together with Christ. You didn't make yourself alive because dead people can't make themselves live. It's God who makes us alive. He made us alive together with Christ. Christ rose from the dead by his own victorious power as God, made us alive together with Christ, and then this little statement, by grace you have been saved. In other words, you didn't make yourself alive, you didn't do anything, you have been saved only by the grace of God. And notice this, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and I love this verse, so that in the coming ages, for all of eternity... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. There's not one person in heaven today that is bragging about themselves. They're bragging about the immeasurable riches of the kindness of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God. Because Paul writes in the next verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. So stop acting like you can take credit for it. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of works, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. 
grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the gospel. That is the good news that saves us. The church was teaching grace alone through the church. But what the Bible teaches is this, that every person in this room today who acknowledges that they are a sinner and in need of a Savior and who wants a relationship with God and understands that without God you're empty and you need His grace in your life, if you come to God by faith in Christ alone and you understand that your salvation is by God's grace alone, you don't need a church, you don't need a pastor, you don't need a priest, you don't need a prayer, you don't need to be baptized. When you come to God by faith, He pours His marvelous grace directly into you. There's nothing between you and the grace of God being poured into your life. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Notice how he ends there in that sentence in verse 24 and 25. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, that redemption there, it's a ransom that you might pay for someone that's in bondage, whether a prisoner or a slave. You're dead to sin and enslaved to it. But God paid the price of your sin. He paid the ransom for your soul when he sent Jesus to the cross on your behalf. And he says he sent, he put him forward as a propitiation by his blood. That word propitiation, it's appeasement or satisfaction. Your sins have to be dealt with in the hands of and the eyes of an almighty, powerful, and holy God. God cannot just look at our sin and act like it's nothing. That wrath of God must be appeased. And on the cross, Jesus bore took the wrath of God He took the wrath of God that I deserved and he took it in his body on the cross. It's an unbelievable thought that God took his, that Jesus took the wrath of God in his body for me. In the Old Testament, there was a mercy seat and on the day of atonement, the animal would be sacrificed and the blood of that sacrifice would be poured out on the mercy seat. And the Hebrew word for that is similar to the Greek word that's translated propitiation. It's the blood. It's the blood of the Lamb that saves us. By grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ alone. Friday morning, I sat on the front seat of the auditorium at a memorial service for a man named Billy Deal. It's Mike Deal's dad. Mike and I ran into each other a few years ago through Little League. He had no idea that I was on a mission. I met Mike when I was at a low point in my life spiritually. And I began to talk to Mike about faith. We were eating lunch one day at Woodall's Barbecue, and I just asked him, Mike, do you know for sure that you're you're going to heaven. Do you know for sure that you're right with God? And he was honest. He said, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. And we spent a lot of time talking about it and sharing the gospel of Christ. He had a lot of religion in his life, had a lot of things in his life, thoughts, skepticism. But I'll never forget when Mike 
texted me and said, thanks, babe. You're the best. Sorry about that, team. Just overwhelmed. My bad. And I'll never forget when he texted me and told me, I, I, I believe it. I had the opportunity to baptize Mike. And on Friday, I'm sitting on that front seat, and I was crying, yes, because my friend lost his dad. But I listened to Mike share his story. And his story, the hero, is not Mike, and it's not a pastor who shared the gospel with him. It's Christ and Christ alone. And talking to his family and friends, he asked them the same question. Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? Did you know sitting in this room today that every person here can know for sure you're going to heaven? But I'm telling you this. If the hero of your story is a church, if it's a loved one, if it's you, then you're not saved. Because salvation comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So right where you're sitting today, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you, I want you to know that good news is good news for you, for everyone who would believe it. And I pray sitting right where you are today that you'll receive it in your heart and be saved from your sins. Listen, the gospel is a hill worth dying on. I'm passionate about the gospel because the gospel is the power of God to save. And I pray that you'll believe that today. Listen, if you're looking for a church home and you haven't been connected, if it's the book, Brook, great. We'd love you and we'd love for you to be a part of it. If it's somewhere else, great. We're all on the same team if we're all preaching the same gospel. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Most people don't know how to define the gospel. And here's the good news. Jesus died, he was buried, and rose again, and he'll save you. Right where you're sitting today, have you placed your faith in him? Let's stand together. Let me just pray over us today. Father, just overwhelmed by your goodness, by your kindness and your mercy, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that Christ took my place on the tree so that me, being a guilty sinner, so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the good news that it's not about me, it's about what Christ has done. And my prayer today, God, is there's not one person that would leave this room today without the assurance in their heart that they're saved, that they've been saved from the penalty of their sins because of what Christ did for them. I pray that standing there right now, even as I pray, that they would turn to you in faith and look to the cross to find the salvation that they need. And we do it all, Lord, today and every day for the glory of God alone. So I pray that you've been magnified and lifted up in every song that we've offered up today, from every word that's been preached, from every prayer that we've offered. I pray that you receive all the glory from it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.